Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the World Over Live. Thanks for joining us. Lots to share with you this week. The White House rolled out the red carpet for communist Chinese leader Hu Jintao. Here to talk about what was accomplished, particularly regarding China's abysmal record on human rights and religious freedom, is a survivor of the Chinese labor camps. Human rights activist Harry Wu is here. And later, we'll discuss the repeal of President Obama's health care reform law by the U.S. House of Representatives. Is it morally necessary to repeal the law? John Brahaney, executive director of the Catholic Medical Association, will join us in studio. If you've got any questions or comments about any of these topics, call us now, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. And here's a question for you. Was it appropriate for President Obama to throw Hu Jintao a lavish state dinner at the White House, given the human rights record of that country. Send your answers to worldover at EWTN.com or call us and we'll share them with the audience. Now let's get to it. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. There was much pomp and circumstance as the U.S. hosted the first state dinner for China since 1997 at the White House. President Barack Obama welcomed President Hu Jintao in grand style, despite the aggressive moves against the U.S. by China in recent years. The communist leader was regaled with full honors and a red carpet greeting. The South Lawn Ceremony marked the start of a day-long event, a meeting on trade, security, and human rights, which have been the cause of past strain between the two powers. At a press conference later that day, on Wednesday, President Hu acknowledged that a lot still needs to be done to improve human rights in China. But later, he pointedly added, quote, China and the United States should respect each other's choice of development paths and each other's core interests, end quote. More about President Hu's visit and the sad Chinese record on human rights and religious freedom and what was accomplished this week in our next segment. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, the newly empowered House Republican majority moved swiftly to honor their campaign pledge. On Wednesday, they passed legislation to repeal President Obama's year-old health care overhaul. By a vote of 245 to 189, three Democrats joined all 242 Republicans to pass the bill. However, Democratic Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid has already said the legislation will not see the light of day at the other end of the Capitol. Senate Republicans are insisting on an up or down vote. In the meantime, GOP officials in the House said they will use the coming months to propose changes to the existing law. To that end, on Thursday, pro-life legislators introduced the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, which would strictly bar any federal funding of abortion. Legislative action on conscience protections for health care providers have also commenced. And the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has made its voice heard in the new Congress. In a letter sent to the members of Congress earlier this week, Conference President Archbishop Timothy Dolan outlined the bishops' nine legislative priorities for the coming year. Topping the list, protecting innocent human life. The letter reads, most fundamentally, we will work to protect the lives of the most vulnerable and voiceless members of the human family, especially unborn children and those who are disabled or terminally ill. We will consistently defend the fundamental right to life from conception to natural death. The letter continues, in close connection with our defense of all human life, we stand firm in our support for marriage. Also among the bishop's priorities, health care access, immigration reform, protecting the poor and vulnerable in this tough economy, and fair access to private school education. 
And in Philadelphia, a doctor who offered abortions to poor women at his clinic has been charged with eight counts of murder, including the deaths of a patient and seven babies who were born alive and then murdered. Prosecutors claim Dr. Kermit Gosnell performed as many illegal late-term abortions as he could up to the eighth month of pregnancy, earning him millions of dollars during his 30-year career. Some of Gosnell's employees have also been charged with murder. Philadelphia District Attorney Seth Williams on the arrest. He gave medicines to the women that induced labor, induced live births, so children were born and then killed. Killed by putting scissors in the back of their neck and snipping their spinal cord. Horrific stuff. Williams further described the West Philadelphia Clinic as a house of horrors. Bags and bottles holding aborted fetuses and body parts were found throughout the building for no good reason. Squalid conditions at the clinic were so bad, the grand jury went to the scene wearing hazmat suits. The clinic has been shut down and Gosnell's medical license suspended. And some startling numbers on the link between abortion and breast cancer. The Coalition on Abortion Breast Cancer released a statement estimating that since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, abortions have led to approximately 300,000 breast cancer deaths in the U.S. Using an analysis of data showing that women who have an abortion are 30% more likely to develop breast cancer, Dr. Joel Brind of the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute simply applied that rate to the 50 million abortions since Roe v. Wade. That calculates an additional 1.5 million women who developed breast cancer. Factor in the mortality rate for breast cancer victims, 20 percent. The result is the death of approximately 300,000 breast cancer victims due to abortions. Karen Malik, the president of the Coalition on Abortion Breast Cancer, further criticized highly publicized studies, dissing or dismissing rather that link as badly flawed. She said the flawed studies were used to snow women into believing abortion is safe, not unlike the tobacco cancer cover-up. And the anniversary of Roe v. Wade is just days away. Be sure to join EWTN for live coverage of the annual Walk for Life in San Francisco on Saturday day the 22nd and the March for Life here in Washington DC on Monday the 24th. Go to EWTN.com for details. And church history was made this past weekend as the Vatican erected the first personal ordinariate as it is called for Anglicans entering the Catholic Church. On Saturday three former Anglican bishops were ordained Catholic priests and the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith announced the establishment of the new ordinariate for England and Wales. Pope Benedict named Father Keith Newton, one of the three former Anglican bishops, to head the ordinariate. Not unlike a diocesan bishop, Father Newton is charged with shepherding its faithful. More Anglicans are expected to be received into the church in the spring. The ordinariates allow Anglican communities to maintain their distinct liturgical and pastoral traditions while being fully in communion with the Holy See. And Sergeant Shriver, longtime public servant and husband of the late Eunice Kennedy Shriver, died on Tuesday in Washington, D.C. He was 95. A member of the Kennedy family through his marriage to Eunice, Shriver had his own legacy of historical achievements. He was the first director and driving force behind the creation of the Peace Corps. Under the Johnson administration, he led the war on poverty. And in 1972, he was George McGovern's vice presidential mate and thus holds the distinction of being the last pro-life Democrat to run on a national ticket. A devout Catholic, Shriver wrote in the National Catholic Register that the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision, quote, has gone down and will continue in an increasingly powerful downward slide, end quote. After his career in politics, Shriver became president and chairman of the Special Olympics, the organization founded by his wife. He spoke fondly of the mentally disabled children he served, saying once, what I learned most from them was the meaning of the word love. 
When you see someone who's mentally retarded express love, it is genuine love. There is no guile. It is pure, as God intended. May Roger or Robert Sergeant Shriver know that true and pure love. May he rest in peace. And finally tonight, EWTN announced earlier this week that it was acquiring the National Catholic Register, one of the most prominent and long-running national Catholic papers in the United States. Joining us to discuss the acquisition is EWTN President and CEO Michael Warsaw. He joins us from our Birmingham studios. Thanks for being with us, Michael. It's great to be with you, Ray. Look, I have to say, I was a little surprised when I read the press release. Why does a television network acquire a paper in the midst of this huge digital transition away from periodicals? Well, sure. You know, I, I, think, uh, I think it's a great question. Um, first of all, I think the National Catholic Register fits squarely within the mission of EWTN. Uh, I think news, as you know, was something that was very important to Mother Angelica uh, many, many years ago. In fact, it was Mother who herself insisted that a news service was one of the core elements of EWTN's apostolate. Uh, so I, I think it makes a lot of sense for EWTN uh, to bring the National Catholic Register under its umbrella. Um, it's a great publication with an 80-year history, and that's a, that, that's a tradition and a legacy that needed to continue. Uh, it was in danger of, of uh, going away and disappearing. And I think the silencing of that faithful Catholic voice that the Register has been throughout its history uh, would be a real loss for the Church. So I think it was uh, certainly a, a good and opportune moment for EWTN to step in and uh, to not only to save the Register and stabilize it, but really to provide it an opportunity for growth. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. If you look at the secular paradigms, everyone's talking about digital and uh, print publications going away and so forth. But let's be honest, the New York Times is not going to stop uh, its print edition uh, tomorrow. Uh, perhaps we'd pray that it might, but it's simply not going to happen. I think we all know that there is going to be a digital transition. I think the Register uh, has had uh, the beginnings of a very good digital transition plan. And I think under EWTN, with our capacities and our resources uh, in the digital realm, we'll be able to continue that migration but also continue the, the great legacy of that print publication. Now, Michael, in one of the articles I read, it said no cash was exchanged, so EWTN assumed the debt of the National Catholic Register. It obviously wasn't self-sustaining. How do you sustain it into the future and make it self-sustaining? Sure. Well, let me, and let me clarify, Raymond. We, we didn't really acquire or uh, uh, assume the debt of the Register. We assume the, the future subscription liabilities. In other words, the promises that were made to uh, subscribers to uh, receive a, a copy of the paper going forward. Uh, and we promise to uh, continue the operations of the, of the paper. Um, but it clearly, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, the Register has been uh, very challenged. Uh, it's found uh, in, a, in a difficult economy. Uh, certainly being a publication that has been owned by the Legion of Christ, uh, the difficulties of the Legion and the reform of the Legion that's underway has certainly had an impact uh, upon uh, the Register's operations. But over the last year, the, the Register's uh, lay staff uh, has done, I think, a tremendous job of really trying to uh, reorganize, uh, to make the Register a much more efficient, much more uh, uh, productive uh, organization. And uh, our hope and our goal is to be able to continue that uh, and, as I've said, really to not only allow it to survive, but really to, to help it to grow and to help it to uh, really maintain its stature as the Catholic newspaper of record in the United States. Final question, Michael. What is your vision for the paper, and who do you see leading it up? Well, I, I think... At least in the short term, I think we, we certainly see that uh, readers would probably see very little change from what uh, they've seen in the past. Um, over the long term, I think we'll see uh, much more integration into the paper of faces and names uh, familiar to our EWTN audiences around the globe. Uh, I think we'll see uh, much more uh, cross-pollination, perhaps, uh, uh, between uh, EWTN's television, radio, internet services, uh, and the register. So uh, I think it provides another piece of what is a, uh, a very big um, tool for evangelization 
uh, and, and I think we'll, uh, uh, we'll look forward to expanding that and, and integrating it with our other, uh, our other outlets. Very good. We'll leave it there. Michael Warsaw, CEO and President of EWTN. Thanks for being with us, Michael. Thanks, Raymond. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. When we return, we'll explore China's record on human rights and the religious freedom there with a 19-year survivor of the Chinese labor camps. Harry Wu is here, and he'll tell us what he thought was accomplished by the Chinese president's U.S. visit this week. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My first guest was a prisoner in a Chinese forced labor camp for nearly 20 years. His crime? Criticizing the Communist Party as a 23-year-old in 1960. After his release in 1979, he continued to investigate these camps, forming the Lagai Research Foundation, in 1992 for that purpose. Here to discuss the human rights situation in China, as well as this week's state visit by Communist Party leader Hu Jintao, please welcome Harry Wu. Welcome back to the program, Harry. Great to see you. We're also joined by Mark Miloš. He is the senior advisor on international affairs to Congressman Chris Smith on Capitol Hill, and you all have been so ahead of the curve on so many of these uh, human rights issues. Mark, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, let's start with this big state visit. This past Wednesday, the White House threw a lavish state dinner in honor of Hu Jintao. Barbara Streisand was there, Jackie Chan, uh, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, Henry Kissinger, who initiated so many of the troubles with China, in my opinion. This is an honor bestowed on allies of the United States. What message does this send to the Chinese supporters of democracy and those imprisoned in China today, Harry? Well, first of all, uh, you did not really describe very detailedly. When 1950, I was 13 years old, mm -hmm. I was baptized as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So actually, the two reasons, one is my father was a banker, is a capitalist class, and uh, second is probably I was a Catholic. And since then, all the Catholic wipe out entirely. Mm. Uh, so the last bishop was 1956, re uh, re arrested. But later he came to the United States and died in America. Mm -hmm. Until today, Roma Catholic in China illegal. So this is so-called religious freedom. Right. And uh, there's that patriotic association, which is the state-run facade of a church. Yes, 1980 Chinese. Uh, Communist government said, "Well, we we have to open for the foreigners, so we have set up some uh -huh. some religions. So the communists set up the pay the money, set up the church, and patriotic or Catholic. Mm -hmm. So they nominate their bishop, and Roma Catholic is illegal. Mm -hmm. And the other thing you just remind in your report that say abortion, mm -hmm. twenty two percent of the world population live in China, but all of the men and women." they very carefully have to, when they make a laugh. Mm -hmm. Before marriage, definitely you cannot pregnant. After you marry, you have the permit, you have a first child. That's it. If you're pre pre pregnant again, illegal. Mm -hmm. If for subject to forced abortion, mm -hmm. subject to sterilization. How many people sterilize, how many people abortion? I do not know, but actually, the number is come by millions every Million. year. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you think, given all of that, and the, what, 300,000 people today is the estimate I saw in the New York Times the other day, could be in these labor camps? That's, that's the estimate of the New York Times. 300,000? They're saying 300,000. You no, think it's more? at least 3 million. Three really? Million. Yeah. 3 million people in the labor camps at today? At least, yeah. Given that, and most of them are rounded up for being political dissidents or, or practicing their faith, what do you think is the reaction seeing President Hu Jintao, the leader of the Communist Party in China, saluted in the way he was this past week at the White House? There's a lot of communist leader in the world today. Every of them, they don't like the religions at all. Mm -hmm. okay. They don't care. It's, 
in the country, only one party ruling the country. So that's why the Wu Jintao come up here. You want to do the business, do it. Human rights is our internal domestic issue. Mm -hmm. They never want to talk about it. Yeah, and that was okay. the message this week. Yeah. What, what, do, what do you think is the message, Mark, conveyed by those images? The First Lady and the President welcoming Hu Jintao. He looks like any other <coughs> ally of the United States, mm -hmm. being feted mm -hmm. and, and honored. President George Bush, by the way, when, he, when Hu Jintao last visited, restricted him to a lunch. They had a private lunch. There were no photographs. Right. There was no pomp and circumstance. What does this, this optic teach the world and those who love democracy and freedom mm -hmm. of religion? Mm -hmm. Well, Raymond, we know very well what, what, what the lesson is because there have been so many Chinese prisoners who have gotten out over the years. And uh, many of them, by the way, have, have come to Chris Smith's office and, and, and told us what, what the message is. The message what, when the Chinese leaders are feted and, 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 uh, and uh, treated like heroes, close allies by U.S. presidents is, see, you are forgotten. You know, the jailers go to these people and, and, and say, look, the, the U.S. government has forgotten you. Nobody remembers you. You are forgotten. You are alone. And it makes it a lot tougher because they're alone in their own country. They're alone mm -hmm. in a cell. And, uh, you know, they rely on, on, on support from outside to give them the strength they need. Not everyone can be a, uh, a Cardinal Kung, whom Harry referred to. Referred to a, a, a man of iron who spent 30 years in, in, in mm -hmm. prison. And to this day, we hear reports. Eight bishops recently rounded up who were, uh, you know, who, who didn't want to go to a consecration of an illicit bishop that the regime had picked or an, uh, an illicit mm -hmm. priest. And these bishops wanted to stay home or get lost. They were rounded up and brought in. And some were, are still in prison as a result of this. So th this goes on, yes, Harry? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Catholic in China is not really a big uh, population. Mm -hmm. So, but it's one of the serious problems, okay? I want to remind the people today, uh, Henry Kissinger was there. Right. Uh, he never talked about human rights. No. He talking about power of balance, okay? He just say, well, China have their domestic, their cultural, their history, I don't care. But we, you, have you heard Henry Kissinger visit Japan? No. Mm -hmm. American very care about Japan. So how to balance Japan and China, this is the way. Okay, mm -hmm. anyway, until today, the Americans really wrongly do not really understand what is China, okay? This country, the human rights issue, much worse than the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. okay? And we treat it badly. For example, IBM recently apologized to Nazi Germany when Nazi Germany, he sell the calculator to them. Right. So this is wrong, whatever. Do you know Cisco systems? Cisco sell the equipment, a technology to Chinese security system. Mm. China have a national program so-called Golden Share Program. Right. Okay. And not only sell the products, but also training the Chinese police. Mm. Okay. And in Liu Xiaobo, you know, Liu Xiaobo win the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. Okay. Liu Xiaobo sent 260 articles to our website, observechina.org. Mm -hmm. But our website was blocked by Chinese government. Uh, so the How people in China can't have access cannot. to it. Working with Google and Yahoo and those other American companies who have set up uh, their own stations in Hong Kong, and apparently they're passing information. When one of these dem democracy-loving uh, individuals or faithful individuals in China send messages out, Yahoo, Google, and these other companies are reporting them to the, to the Chinese authorities. So don't I just read this report the other day. A businessman, you had it on your website. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So Chinese block our website because Cisco systems sell the technology and training police. And... Liu Xiaobo article cannot see it inside China. Mm -hmm. But Chinese picked three articles, so-called, this is a crime for Liu Xiaobo, intent to subvert the government. But people say, including some who were at that state dinner the other night, you engage China with an open market, you, will, you start to trade, and inevitably, inevitably, they will catch the whiff of democracy and realize this is the way to go. 
What do you think of that strategy, Mark? And then, Harry, I want you to react. Well, I think that strategy has been proven false. We, you know, we, we, we had a, there was a vote in Congress on permanent normal trade relations, which brought China into the WTO in 2000. Right. And uh, you know, this was the theory all over the pages, uh, the editorial pages of the leading American papers, that if we let them into the WTO, they will trade, we will trade, they will change. And uh, at, th at that time, if you had told anybody, well, in 2010, the most credible human rights organizations will conclude that China has gone backward. It would, have, it would have been considered unthinkable at the time, yet it's happened. A mm. And yet, at the, at the same time, the, the people who pushed the PNTR vote, the interest groups, mm -hmm. the China-U.S. Uh, intellectual aristocracy that manages the relationship, right. none of them have ever admitted the mistake. Recently, okay. yeah, you do have the idea, so-called, we sell in the capitalism to China and mm -hmm. capitalist class brew, gourmet, or whatever. But you did not say that during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. You don't do that with the Soviet Union. No, well, why are you funding? You say Soviet Union is evil. Right. You cannot do it. The evil empire, okay. yeah. Evil empire. So finally, we bring down the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And now we're different. We treated Chinese communists as a different way. And it's because of the size of that market. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because you're concerned about... I mean, the other problem is even uh, you know, so many say, well, this is market driven. We have to do this to keep American business alive. There's a two hundred and fifty two billion dollar trade deficit with China. The president talked a little bit about that or so it was reported. President Obama and Hu Jintao apparently discussed everything from trade barriers to uh, human rights. But this was the big breakthrough that the president announced at the state dinner. Listen to this. Mr. President, well, today we've shown that our governments can work together as well for our mutual benefit. And that includes uh, this bit of news. Under a new agreement, our national zoo will continue to dazzle children and visitors with the beloved giant pandas. Harry, you spent 19 years in a labor camp. When you hear that the result of this summit between China and the United States was that the panda would get a five-year lease here at the National Zoo. What was your reaction? I, uh, I have to correct you. Not only 19 years. They re-arrest me and sentenced me under the 15 years. Oh, my gosh. So I, I, as a Chinese government view that I have to deprive my freedom 34 years, mm. what is my crime? I do want you to know. Am I a terrorist? Am I a murderer? Mm -hmm. A rapist, a bank of rob robbery, whatever. Mm -hmm. I just say a few words. That's it. Just like Lucio Bohr, say a few words and 11 years. That's mm -hmm. I, I want to tell you. I understand the president, whatever, today's Obama, a couple of years ago was Bush, and later was uh, Clinton. They have a problem. The problem is right now the Chinese is a kind of uh, controlled economy there. Mm -hmm. And they said there's another problem is Chinese using the money, very good improving their military systems. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they don't care this domestic problem. Okay, it's so-called human rights problem, domestic, our internal issue. So that's why you see China become a huge political power and military power and security power is unbalanced the war. Mark, your reaction to that, that we, we, we came out of this with a five-year lease on the panda at the National Zoo. Right, the National right, Zoo, incidentally, right. wanted a 10-year lease. So right. we couldn't even get an extended lease on the darn panda. But go ahead. All right, Raymond. I was in a room full of people when this was announced, and uh -huh. uh, the general reaction was great merriment. But there's a kind of sadness to it, because it's a, it's a, it's a confession of the bankruptcy of the policy. I mean, when, 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 when you... When you give China so much power over us and engage them in a way that gives them power over us. And at the end, all you have to show for it are, are, are these obviously purely symbolic, empty, empty, empty gestures. Well, not only that, they're leasing them to us. It's $500,000 a year to keep these things here. So it's not as if this is a gift. It should be I an couldn't believe that. That was in the Washington Post today. Better not to do it at all. It should be an embarrassment, but they don't realize it. It, it, it is remarkable to me. And the Boeing agreement, there was a big announcement that Boeing, the uh, aircraft specialist, was going to share technology, build aircrafts for China. Why would the United States government allow American ingenuity and ideas to be transferred only to be used against us later, Harry? 
The Boeing business with China is not only sell the products. Chinese have harshly the pressure that Boeing is want to get the technology. It's the technology they're, yes. they're after. Sooner or later, China will going to rebuild their aircraft mm -hmm. very soon. Mm -hmm. You will see that will happen first. Harry, I want you to talk about what happens in these labor camps. This week, I heard virtually nothing in any of the media reports. They talked about human rights violations, but no one got down to the granular level and talked about the number of people in these labor camps and what they're doing and what they're intended to do. Enlighten us briefly. <sighs> you heard the story from Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You heard the story from Cambodian killing field. And you heard about the Gulag story. But what is the Lao Gai story? Oh, Lao Gai, something, I don't know. Chinese labor camp from 1949 to today, 61 years. Probably they sent more than 40 million people in there. I'm one of it. I survived. Mm. Okay? For example, I find a Chinese classified document. In 1956, Prime Minister Zhou and I ordered two provinces, Zhejiang and Jiangsu and Shanghai City, arrange two million prisoners go to the Huaiho River, build the construction of the river, dam on the river. And 11 months later, half of them, it was one million, they die. And mm -hmm. Liu Shaoqi said, well, we have to care about these people, not really have to put them in this bad situation because we need the labor for us. That is so-called Lao Gai. Huh. And, it, and this goes on today. This isn't some relic of the past. This is happening now. Happening now, very interesting. Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, mm -hmm. never forced to labor. OK? Just because this is international, well-known guy. He's his attention upon Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eat good and put it over there. Let the West to, to verify. But we recently find out there's a products import China, import from China, Henan province, number two prison, to the construction company uh, in uh, Arbeto in, in Canada. And we, we, we also talked to the Henan province, number two prison, and we signed a contract with them. So there's more than three million prisoners, and each prison camp, they are uh, enterprises. Hmm. Working. Okay. This is amazing. This is a question coming into our website. I want to read this to you, Mark, and let you react. Where are our ethics in government? It says, doing these things for a dictator, forced abortion, slave labor. Greg from Fort Worth. Mark, what is the answer here? What is Congress prepared to do, and what is possible? You've been covering this for years. You're asking about a very discouraging situation, Raymond. Uh, I know in, in the early 1990s, there were hundreds of congressmen who, who, who were willing to speak out annually, regularly, strongly, mm -hmm. uh, vote in favor of withdrawing uh, most favored nation trade status from China. You know, over the years, that, that group diminished. They were a minority by, by the year 2000. Uh, mm -hmm. They probably grow smaller in every succeeding Congress. Well. However, the, the... Because of the business interests who are with the such deep interest, tentacles in, in, in China at this point. Business interest and, and, and a sense that, that, that uh, the, 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 the cause is lost. The, the, but but, but there, there, are the, there, there are a number of members who are still very strong uh, in raising these issues. Mm -hmm. Chris Smith, Frank Wolf, right. Joe Pitts, Trent Franks, there, and, and there are others. But uh, at, at this point, uh, what we really need is a move from the president uh, to... to, to, uh, to step in and, and, and open up the policy and, and begin including people in China, in, in China policy who are not, all of them, of a uniform mindset, uh, of, 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 that, of that mindset mm -hmm. that, that created the, the engage, engage with China at any price on their terms policy. And, and uh, we, we really need some leadership from the executive in order, in order to continue this struggle. In, I mean, in Congress. People have no concept of how dire the situation is. I, I was stunned. Uh, Chai Lang, Ling, who's one of the, uh, Taiwan, uh, the Tiananmen Square student activists, he reported this week that there are 30, or she rather, 35,000 forced abortions a day in China. Yeah. Why isn't this reported? And yet we're trading and we're exchanging and Apple's going in and major companies and we're sending our internet technology and aeronautics technology. <laughs> What? Let me, let me give it? you a case, okay. When she talking about 1990, the debate of the most vivid nation trading status, I so remember at the time, 68% of Americans say no 
in most favored nation trading status to China. And remember, Clinton at that time said, yeah, I joined with him. He got the election, mm -hmm. so he became president. And then he gave the Chinese one year to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the condition is talking about Chinese stop the forced labor product import to the United States. But after one year, entirely finished. And Clinton visited China, and the tree was... And now we're buying products at Walmart and Target that are, in many ways, part of... Even today. Even today. Part of, part of, the, of the, pr the, the prisoner uh, and, and, and these mm -hmm. labor camp uh, Cheap. products. Cheap. But at what cost? Eventually, they're going to raise these rates. They're going to ra start charging. Once everyone's addicted to the product, they're inevitably going to raise it. And then what happens? When they're holding so much United States debt at the moment, which is the other reason, I think, they have such leverage. I mean, the, the United States really has no leverage in this situation, do they? This is the perception, but 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 uh, there was a hearing of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, just yesterday in, in which uh, two or three witnesses said very strongly that it's a false perception. We create this perception through through uh, uh, the media largely, but but financial experts will tell you that that that, that when, when when you owe them money, you also have pressure over them. Mm -hmm. and, and this is true in everyday life, mm -hmm. too. Harry, the thing we, we haven't had a chance to talk about, and I want to do it briefly before we go. We're almost out of time. Uh, you've also been doing a lot of reporting over the years on the organ harvesting that goes on in these labor camps and in the, the prisoner population. Tell us quickly about that. Well, according to Chinese uh, uh, law information, that uh, all the prisoners, when they're sentenced to death, a couple of thousand a year, okay, uh, they voluntarily, well, so-called voluntarily, can harvest the organ for, for the transplantation. And uh, recently, they just a little bit forbidden the foreigners to go there. But there are some as American from California when they got the liver or transportation. Mm -hmm. Because almost no one, a few, a few of them, want to donate their organ. So most of the organ actually come from executive prisoners. China become number two country of the world today. In 19, 2006, the vice minister of the uh, uh, health, uh, let's say, America is the number one country of the world. They have 15,300 transplants a year, but none of the organ come from executive prisoners. China have 13,000 organ transplants, but mostly it come from oh. executive prisoners. Terrifying stuff. Terrifying stuff. Well, we hope we've given you a little light on this situation. It is a, it is a dark corner, and watching uh, all of this unfold this week has been uh, perplexing and vexing, I think, for so many of us. But uh, I want to thank you, Harry Wu, for uh, joining us. Uh, you can find more of Harry's continuing work exposing the forced labor camps uh, at the Logai Research Foundation's website, Logai, L-A-O-G-A-I dot org. I also want to thank Mark Maloche from Chris Smith's office. Thank you for your thank work. You, and uh, we hope you'll both come back. This is a fascinating time right now. When we return, we'll talk about the repeal of health care reform in the United States. It passed the House. Now what? And is it needed, morally speaking? John Brahaney of the Catholic Medical Association is up next. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Washington was a hotbed of activity this week. Not only did we see a visit by the leader of the communist uh, regime in China, we also saw a vote in the House of Representatives to repeal the health care reform passed last year. Is it just a symbolic gesture or an opportunity to eliminate or improve a flawed piece of legislation? And what about the Catholic concerns about the law? I'm now joined by medical ethicist and executive director of the Catholic Medical Association, Dr. John Brahaney. Dr. John, Thank welcome back to the show. Uh, the bishops this week sent a letter to Congress, and they said they're looking for a bill that allows quality, affordable, life-giving care for all, protects conscience rights, and prohibits the use of federal funds toward abortion, and access to health care that immigrants currently have. They want that to continue. Um, they have also said they want to correct the moral problems in the current law. 
Is a repeal the best way to do that? Well, I think there are substantial problems. We support all their goals. I think where, where we would come down is saying that uh, how are you actually going to achieve affordable and quality health care? We don't think this is an effective means to achieve it. We agree with them on the key moral failings of the bill, which are the very deliberate attempt to ensure an avenue for abortion funding and to be vague on conscience rights. Those are real problems. Um, However, we think there are more ethical issues to consider. One of the chief ones, the power that this bill vests in the federal government and in the regulatory agencies, especially the Department of Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. that, that problem is absolutely central. And I think, given that it is so much a part of the structure of the bill, something significant is going to uh, going to have to happen you know i'm i'm not a politician so there may be avenues other than repeal but i have a philosophy background and my opinion is the bill has to undergo substantial change mm -hmm. and uh... i mean just to give people uh, a little taste section thirteen oh three facilitates a massive federal subsidy for private health care plans that are offered through these health insurance exchanges particularly those and those who cover elective abortions. The question is, does that section, 1303, do you think that opens the door to encourage Catholic hospitals, indeed, create a situation where Catholic hospitals seem to be out of step or in violation of federal law should they decide not to fund and or provide abortions? You know, I think the law is set up to put the government in charge of, of dictating, defining and dictating what constitutes um, acceptable health care insurance levels and services. And in a system like that, which is, is essentially government defined and controlled, it is going to be more difficult for Catholic hospitals to operate in full fidelity to the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. that is, yeah, no, it's, it's, and the discretion left to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, in this case currently Kathleen Sebelius, is extreme and wide. Uh, and, and as you said, it, it's very difficult to see how you can sort of pull a clause out and change one part of it without the whole thing collapsing, because it does hang together. Let's talk about what the president promised when the bill was first passed. He said health insurance premiums would be reduced. Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely not. I think everybody knows that their premiums are going up and, in fact, are projected to go up over the, uh, the coming years. People are already seeing the changes, a minimum of probably 9 to 10 percent this year. Now, people are saying that, that's, that that was happening anyway. The health care law had nothing to do with it. Well, <laughs> they may be saying that, and costs are going up in health care, mm -hmm. but there are actually good reasons why Obamacare is leading to an increase in health care costs. Mm -hmm. It is demanding that people insure themselves for more and more things and right. that, and that uh, health insurance companies not charge up front for certain services. Right. Well, there's no free lunch. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to pay for that. No, there are additional benefits. I've spoken to some people in the insurance realm, and they, they say there are so many new benefits required under the federal law that to prepare for the onslaught, the insurance companies are going to have to boost these premiums, and they could go up to, some, we're seeing some parts of the country, they're as high as 20 and 30 percent this year, the premiums are going up, and the, the law hasn't even fully engaged yet. Absolutely. And companies are also uh, having to increase their spending to deal with, with new requirements for electronic medical records to comply with new regulations. I mean, all these things take time and money, and they are going to drive up costs. The president, uh, the leadership in Congress at the time, Nancy Pelosi and others, were saying you can keep the doctor you have now, and if you like your insurance carrier, you can keep them. Do you believe now, looking at this, and what are your members telling you, the physicians, you are the largest Catholic group of physicians in the country. What are they saying? Well, a couple of things on those lines. We have already seen the beginnings of disruption in the health insurance market. There have been a whole slew of small companies, interestingly enough, many unions who have said, we can't meet the requirements of the new health care law. We'll have to drop the insurance we're providing. Catherine Sebelius has been providing hundreds of waivers this year already to small companies mm -hmm. who, who cannot comply 
comply. The other thing uh, that, that just came out this last fall is a major uh, uh, group that does analysis of the health insurance industry says in the years 2014 to 2016, 80 to 100 million people will be changing their health insurance coverage for oh different reasons. Gosh. Employers will be dropping it. Companies will no longer be offering plans because they're too expensive in the Medicare Advantage program, which I, I believe Real something important like to seniors. 13 million seniors are in it. The, the uh, premiums that the federal government has been paying into that program are, go are going to be cut almost down to zero with the result that according to the chief actuary of the Medicare program of CMS said that enrollment in Medicare Advantage will fall by half. Wow. And out-of-pocket costs for seniors will go up. And physicians, what are your members telling you? As I talk to people in Washington, in New York, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, uh, a lot of physicians in private practice are worried. Well, uh, you know, here's one interesting fact. This bill is driving physicians out of private practice. Why? They, they simply are not able to afford the investment for the electronic health records, for regulatory compliance. This is going to drive them into employment uh, situations, uh, you know, where they are no longer independent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and subject to more pressures from, from their employers or from larger groups. So that's a real problem. What physicians are going to see from this bill is more regulation and they're going to see lower reimbursements. Mm -hmm. And that may well drive a lot of physicians out of practice. There have been several surveys of physicians looking at their opinions about the effect of this law. In fact, a major survey just came out this week that Thomson Reuters did, and 65% of physicians said that the quality of care will deteriorate because of Obamacare, only 18% said it would improve. And is that because of the low reimbursement? They, I mean, or demanding higher, higher more, more benefits covered, but no it, reimbursements. It, it's, a, it's a combination of increasing regulation, mm -hmm. also a ratcheting down of reimbursement levels, and also of, of, of the either the medications or the, you know, the interventions or whatever right. that, that are going to be covered. Well, this is my big concern, and we looked at this early on. I know they have these review panels. They're going to have to find some way to limit extraordinary care or what's now seen as basic care, but will be perceived, I think, later on as extraordinary care, particularly for the elderly, those who are infirm or suffering from, from some sort of disability. Do you see a system where they could be truly deprived of care that's essential for their survival? You know, at one level, it's hard to imagine, but they do have a 15-member independent payment advisory board that is going to be uh, laying down, you know, the what, star chamber for what what you what care you could, or you know, could not, uh, not receive. what is going to be reimbursed and at what levels, and it will lead to a severe limitation. We know that they plan to take out 575 billion dollars out of Medicare, you know, between 2010 and 2019. That's a lot of money, and at a time when baby boomers are going to be retiring and utilization goes up. They're hoping to take a lot of spending out that will limit treatment. This is from the Wall Street Journal uh, this week. It said the deepest spending cuts in the bill are in Medicare. Medicare needs real reform that generates genuine budget savings. Sadly, the bill's cuts are illusory. Medicare's payments to health care providers would fall below those of Medicaid. The network of hospitals and physicians willing to care for Medicaid patients is notoriously constrained. About 15% of the nation's hospitals would have to stop seeing Medicare patients in just a few years to stem the bleed. Absolutely, and there's also a high level of dissatisfaction among doctors. We've all heard about this, this uh, doctor payment cut that mm -hmm. they keep putting off, a 21% payment cut. And doctors have said that if they actually carry through and, and force that cut through, uh, many of them will be getting out of practice. Yeah, no, coupled with the moral concerns here, it really is a, a, such a difficult situation. And we'll see what happens here on Capitol Hill. But it is, it is certainly alive now that the House has passed this repeal. Probably won't go anywhere in the Senate, but the sense that something is wrong and needs repair, uh, I think, is, is moving through the Congress. So.
Thank you, Dr. Thank Brahaney. you for having Thanks me. Thanks for being here. For more on Dr. John Brahaney and the Catholic Medical Association, visit their website at cathmed.org. Well, that is all the time we have. Until next week, you can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo or on my Facebook fan page. And my latest project, the only Catholic fully dramatized word-for-word -word audio Bible available anywhere, is available now. It's called The Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible. Michael York, Brian Cox, Blair Underwood, and other incredible actors bring the scriptures to life. Go to RaymondArroyo.com for more information. The banner up top will take you to ordering information. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye now.